Okay, we're going to talk now about the electric field inside a conductor. Section 8, shielding. Got two concepts. This is a very important um, concept for understanding electric circuits. And I don't know, I just think it's pretty cool. Well, let's get right to it. Uh, first thing you might notice on this is that epsilon naught. It's in an earlier concept. It's called the electric what? You're right, the electric permittivity. Excellent. And that's equal to 1 over 4 pi k, the um, 1 over 4 pi times the Coulomb force constant. All right, let's describe the electrostatic charge distribution and electric field inside and outside of a conductor. It's one of the most powerful concepts. To, once you understand this, when you have the power to do things. So let's imagine uh, placing a conductor in an electric field. So, so let's say we have a sphere like this and we place it in a, in a formerly uniform electric field. So electric field, here's a plate here, positively charged plate, negatively charged plate here. Let me replicate that over here. Here's a positively charged plate, negatively charged plate, and we've got an electric field that between those two plates, since they're not point charges, you can get an approximately uniform electric field. There'd be a little bit of fringing. We'll talk about this later near the ends. But in the middle between these two um, plates, you can get an approximately uniform electric field. So this is the electric field. And now we're going to suddenly take a conducting sphere and place it inside this uniform electric field. So think of this as a metal ball that you're going to place in this electric field and then ask what happens. Well, based on what you know about conductors, if it's a metal, then the electrons inside the metal can respond to the electric fields. They can move in response to the electric field. So what's going to happen in a short amount of time is those electrons inside this metal sphere are going to feel that electric field. They're going to be attracted to the positive plate here. They're, they're going to move in a direction opposite the electric field and move toward that plate. But if electrons in this formerly neutral metal sphere get attracted over toward the positive side, that means there's some atoms on the right side of the sphere that are going to get stripped of some of their electrons. So there'd be an accumulation of positive charge on the right side of the sphere and an accumulation of negative charge on the left side of the sphere. And that's what we see right here. Here's the accumulated negative charge on the left side, attracted to the positive plate here, and accumulated positive charge on the right side of the sphere, which is attracted to the negative plate. Well, um, so what we've done here is to then create these charges themselves create their own internal electric field. So if you s forget about the, the uniform field that we started with and you ask about what the field is produced by these accumulated charges, you'd say, well, hang on here. An electric field starts on, begins on positive charges and ends on negative charges. So this is called the induced electric field. Starts on the positive, ends on the negative. And you say, well, wow, that's pretty cool because the imposed, the original electric field is to the right, but the induced electric field is to the left. And how are those two fields related to each other? And the answer is that they exactly cancel each other that charges will continue to redistribute themselves until 
that electric field, that induced electric field in the center cancels out the applied field, leaving, once, once the, this one and that one added together, they leave a zero electric field inside. If it were not so, if there were still some, some field here, some of the original electric field that hadn't been canceled by the induced field, the charges would continue to redistribute until they did. The same thing happens for the charge, re so the charge redistribution on the, on the surface. If the electric field, let's say initially, let's look at this point right here. Originally, this field was to the right, right? So that was the original direction of the field. Well, that electric field is going to exert a force on electrons that's in the opposite direction. So those electrons get pushed in this direction. So it's not going to be in equilibrium. Things are still going to be moving if there's any um, field at this point. So the ultimate, uh, ultimate thing is the following. What you get. All charges are confined to the surface of the conductor. Why? If you had a little spare charge uh, roaming around in the center, it would feel, uh, it would create an electric field, it would create a force on other neighboring electrons. So all charges are confined to the surface. The electric field is zero at any point within the bulk of the conductor. So it's zero. And why is it zero? This induced field cancels the applied field. Uh, and then just outside of the conductor, the electric field has to be perpendicular. If you had a tangential component of electric field that's tangent, here's the surface, and you're, you're having an electric field that's tangential to that surface, it would push electrons around, and they would redistribute until the electric field is perpendicular. So you see in this blow up right here, this electric field line that comes in, comes in perpendicular to the surface. Here's a blow up of it comes in 90 degrees to the surface. Everywhere it has to be perpendicular to the surface. And its magnitude depends on the local surface charge density. This one requires, to show this really requires Gauss's law, and so I'm not going to expect you to, to derive this result, but I do expect you to know it. We'll use it again and again uh, in the very next slide or two, for example. The local electric field, E, its magnitude depends on the local surface charge density, sigma. So this is a new, this is a Greek letter sigma. And it's, it denotes the surface charge density. It's a charge per unit area. And um, so say that for me. Surface charge density sigma is charge per unit area. I heard you. Very good. So sigma, this charge per unit area, uh, its absolute value divided by epsilon naught, the electric permittivity, 1 over 4 pi k, uh, gives the magnitude of the local electric field. And the cute thing about this concept is that it doesn't matter what else is happening in the universe. If you tell me that on this surface right here, there are, say, two coulombs per square meter. So that's a charge per unit area. So that's the surface charge density, sigma, two coulombs per square meter. If you tell me that there's two coulombs of charge per square meter on that surface area, then I can immediately tell you what the electric field is. It will be that two coulombs per square meter divided by epsilon naught, which is one over one, one over four pi k. And the, the cool thing about it, and sometimes it's easy to get confused. You say, well, what about all those extra charges out there? Well, what matters is only the surface charge density because that surface charge density has already taken into account all the charges that are out there in the universe. And all you need to know is that surface charge density. 
okay, uh, these conditions must be met, otherwise electric fields would cause charges to move until these conditions are met. That's why we call this electrostatic charge distribution. This is after these charges have rearranged and they're all happy and they're in place and they're not moving anymore. It takes a tiny, tiny fraction of a second for most uh, normal applications for the, once you've imposed an electric field, for that conductor to respond to the electric fields. Okay, so here's the application that I promised of that, of that concept. Write the electric field of a parallel plate capacitor using the area A and charge Q. All right, so what's a parallel plate capacitor? Well, it's what we've actually been talking about, about how you create uh, an electric field, a uniform electric field. You have a plate here, positively charged. You have a plate here, negatively charged. This plate, uh, the positively charged plate, has a charge plus Q and an area A. This plate is, otherwise, is, is identical, has the same area, but it has opposite charge Q. So the electric field lines are going to come out, begin at the positive side, and end at the negative side, just like you would expect. And how can we find that electric field? And the answer is given by the previous concept. The electric field is the surface charge density, the absolute value of it, divided by the electric permittivity. And the surface charge density is the charge per unit area, charge divided by the area. The charge on one of those plates is Q, the area is A. And so that's the, the electric field of a parallel plate capacitor. Now the cool thing about it is that um, this formula works only right up next to the conductor. So I can apply this formula right up here, right next to that positively charged plate. And I can say, okay, I'm, now I'm looking at this positively charged plate here, it has Q, positive charge Q, has area A, and the electric field right here next to that is sigma over epsilon naught is Q over epsilon naught A. Bingo. Or you can go over here and you can say, um, well, not on this side of the plate, but on the side opposite that you can't see. On that side, I've got the electric field. It has to come in toward negative charges. It's going to be equal to the uh, surface charge density sigma divided by epsilon naught. Well, everything's the same. Q is the same. Its magnitude is the same. Its um, sign is opposite, but its magnitude is the same, so it doesn't affect that result. Area is the same, and you get the same result. And then, given the fact that the electric field is uniform in between the two, then whatever the electric field was here and here should also be in here. Now, there's some fringing. We'll talk about that a little bit later uh, on the edges, but near the center of that. Um, oh, here, here we see a, a diagram, an edge view. If, you're, if, if the plates are close together and you're far from the edges, then you get a pretty uniform um, electric field. Uh, a conceptual example, a charge is suspended at the center of a hollow electrically neutral spherical conductor. Okay, there's a little charge. Show that this charge induces a charge of minus Q on the interior surface. That's this surface here. So we're being asked to show that the amount of charge on this surface is minus Q. Just opposite, the same magnitude but opposite sign of the charge, the point charge in the center. And we're also being asked to show that there's a charge of plus Q on the exterior surface of the conductor. So what we have to understand here is that this is a, uh, it's a basketball, but think of a basketball made out of metal. And at the very center of the basketball is a point positive charge. And we want to know how much charge is on the interior surface of the basketball, and then how much charge is on the exterior surface of the basketball, assuming that the basketball is a conductor. All right, here's a hint. Rule five, electric field lines begin and end on equal amounts of charge. So I've got 
one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight lines coming out from here. And each of those lines is, is responsible uh, for one eighth of the charge here, Q over eight. Well, out here, uh, inside of that little rectangle I've drawn, I must have the same amount of charge as I did in this little rectangle here. Why? Because electric field lines begin and end on equal amounts of charge. So this amount of charge here must be Q over A. And the amount of charge uh, attached to this line must also be Q over A. Same thing for all eight of the other lines. That means, therefore, um, I'm sorry, this must be a charge of minus Q over A because the line's coming into that surface. The, uh, the charge is negative. So the, uh, well, the charge must be negative because the electric field is coming into that surface. So we add up the eight lines and we get that this in inner surface must have a charge minus Q total charge minus Q. Well, how do we know that the charge on the outside surface has to be plus Q? And the argument for that is conservation of charge that we talked about earlier. If you've got a neutral basketball, this was initially neutral, no charge, uh, no net charge on it, then charge cannot be created or destroyed. Same as mass and mass energy. So if you took, if you added some electrons to this uh, interior surface here to create a total amount of charge of minus Q, then you must have taken them from somewhere. And the only place you can take them from is this outer surface. Because there can't be any net charge in the interior like we talked about in the previous concept. So this uh, charge in the outer surface must be plus Q.